Hello and welcome to a very special Saturday Spirituality Group with our guests, Nancy, Artie, and Mary Lee. They are Jehovah's Witnesses who have been involved with the Jehovah's Witnesses for quite some time. And today's discussion will span mental health and mental illness as it appears in the Bible. So without further ado, take it away, you guys. Nancy, you want to start? I'm pleased to be able to speak to members of City Voices today. Uh, and so just as you share with one another their experiences um, to comfort, uh, support, and learn from each other. So I'm going to share with um, uh, you um, an experience um, from Bible, uh, our creator, great psychologist. Um, he's had these experiences written down in the Bible to be able to show how it can help and support us. So I'm going to relate the experience of a woman named Hannah. Just to give some background, Hannah was a person who lived in ancient Israel in a place called Ramah, about 1100 BC, or more than 3000 years ago. Her husband was a man named Elkanah. Besides Hannah, he had another wife named Kamina. The account in the Bible says that Kamina had children, but Hannah had no children. In Hannah's time and culture, not being able to bear children was a source of reproach and shame. This caused Hannah great emotional distress. Hannah was the wife Elkanah loved more. Kamina, deeply jealous of Hannah, would taunt her over not being able to have children. In the scripture, it says she was relentless. Maybe she was not that direct about it, but very passive aggressive. In any case, the result was that Hannah would leave. And not eating. The episodes of crying and lack of appetite were clear signs of depression on Hannah's part. It seemed that Elkana may not have been fully aware of Kamina's behavior towards Hannah. He would ask her, "Why did she weep and not eat?" And why uh, she hold on, that? I'm sorry, Nancy. There's there's it's just not, a there's a lot of um, Nancy. Can you hear me? So Elkana knew that Hannah's <laughs> Had to do with her not uh, okay, uh, Artie and Mary Lee, <laughs> can you explain to Nancy that the but audio is uh, problematic? Treating her, not wanting to support the sword in the family or make a bad situation worse. Every year, the family would make a trip to Shiloh to worship God at the tabernacle. Um, the tabernacle was a satanic structure that was used for worship before the temple in Jerusalem was built. It, it seems that this was a favorite opportunity of Kadena's to make Hannah miserable. Elkanah would give portions of the sacrifices offered to God to Kanina and each of her children, but he would make sure to give a special portion to Hannah. It was then that Kanina would make a special effort to remind Hannah that she was childless, to the point that she would start crying and not even be able to touch her food. She would do this to her year after year. It was on one of these occasions that Hannah, after the meal was finished, went to the tabernacle by herself uh, to pray. The scripture said she was extremely bitter, and as she began to pray, she started to weep uncontrollably. Enduring a difficult situation at home and her barren condition for years had taken an emotional toll on Hannah. And she prayed to God for her son, no doubt as she had many times before, but the Bible says at this time she prayed a long time. She told God everything, really pouring out her feelings to him. She felt she couldn't talk to anyone at home, but with God, she was able to find her safe space. If we had a difficult upbringing or home situation, it can be hard to talk about our feelings or about the past, but God can be that safe space for us. Jehovah can be the best therapist because he always listens and never interrupts. Anyone can go to him. So what was the outcome of Hannah opening up about her pain and concerns to God? The Bible says that her face was no longer downcast. By confiding to God about her distress, she was able to gain back her inner peace. At 1 Peter 5, 7, it says that we can throw all our anxiety on him because he cares for us. After we've tried our best with the situation, can we hand off our concerns to God? 
and leave them in his hands to take care of. We don't have to carry emotional load by ourselves. He can help us to do that. Something else that we can learn. It was a societal expectation in Hannah's time that a woman should get married and have a family. It pained Hannah that she wasn't successful in this area. And she also had someone in her life reminding her that she didn't measure her. Society often measures a person's worth by what they've accomplished in life. But that didn't matter to God. Hannah was still important to him. And so we listened to her. Regardless of what we've been able to accomplish in life, we are important to God. And if we can find him, he'll hear us. So it turns out, Jehovah did answer Hannah's prayer. In about a year's time, Jehovah, um, oh, Hannah became pregnant and had a son. She was so thankful that she brought her son to the tabernacle so that he could serve God the rest of his life there. And he became later became the prophet Samuel. What could a thankful spirit do for us? We might be having a difficult day. But are there one or two things that we can find that are going okay or going well in our life that we can reflect on? Because that can add to our happiness. So we can see in several ways how Hannah's spirituality helped her to get to a better place with her mental well-being. If we remember there's something, someone greater than us and who we can confide in and who values us, then we'll be able to uh, find the inner peace that Hannah was able to. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm coming. Oh, okay. uh, so now, what if a person faces tragedy and hardship in their life? My friend Mary will relate the experience of a woman named Naomi to show us how we can deal with discouragement. Did you know that God saves those who are discouraged? That didn't come from me. That comes from Psalms 34. At times, we may think about the fact that life is short and so filled with problems. So it's understandable that we get discouraged. And a number of God's servants in ancient times felt the same way. But time and again, Jehovah, the God in whom they trusted, comforted and strengthened them. And their accounts were recorded to comfort and instruct us today. Romans 15.4 encourages us by saying, for all things that were written beforehand were written for our instruction, so that through our endurance and through the comfort from the scriptures, we might have hope. Let's consider two worshipers of Jehovah who lived about the same time as Hannah did, who endured discouraging trials, and that is the widow Naomi and her daughter-in-law Ruth. How did God strengthen them? And what lessons can we personally learn from their examples? The answers will reassure us that God is close to those who are brokenhearted, and he always helps those who are discouraged. So what happened to Naomi and Ruth? Well, the land they were living in was severely affected by famine. And Naomi and her family had to leave their home in Bethlehem and settled in the foreign land called Moab. And then Naomi's husband died, leaving her now with two sons, and in time, both men grew up and got married to Moabite women named Ruth and Orpah. About 10 years later, Naomi's sons died, and they left behind no children. Imagine how grief-stricken these three women must have felt. Of course, Ruth and Orpah, they could remarry. They were still young. But what about aging Naomi? Who would take care of her? Naomi became so depressed that at one point she said, don't call me Naomi anymore, call me Mara. And Mara means bitter or angry. She was angry because she went to Moab wealthy 
and, and she came home penniless and without her husband and sons. She was angry because these things she had no control over, and therefore she felt she didn't deserve them. So at this point, we could see that Naomi had a lot of problems. Could anything help Naomi? Let's see. Broken-hearted Naomi now decided to return to Bethlehem where God's compassionate laws were being practiced that could help remedy the situation. According to God's law, his worshipers had to show loyal love to each other. And by Ruth embracing their cultural rules, Ruth learned to show loyal love for Naomi and displayed it by sticking to her. Ruth chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, Ruth said to Naomi, Do not plead with me to abandon you, to turn back from accompanying you. For where you go, I will go. And where you spend the night, I will spend the night. And she let her mother-in-law know that this would be for life. Now, Naomi and her daughter-in-law Ruth traveled to Bethlehem, and they got there in the beginning of the barley harvest, which worked out great because it worked out perfect, perfectly with another compassionate law which made provisions for needy ones like Naomi and Ruth. We will see now why um, that there was a type of a welfare system that was installed in the law. And it's explained in Leviticus 19, 9 and 10, which says, when you reap the harvest of your land, you must not reap the edge of the field completely, and you must not pick up the gleaning of your harvest. In this way, the poor did not have to beg for food. They could obtain it in a dignified way. In Bethlehem, Ruth worked hard collecting barley for herself and Naomi. And as a result, she soon earned a fine reputation with others. And it so happened later that she found out the owner of the field in which Ruth gathered grain was a wealthy man, and his name was Boaz. He was so touched by Ruth's loyalty to Naomi and by the love she was showing her mother-in-law that he took Ruth as a wife. And Naomi now became a permanent part of their family. Now look at the blessings they all received. The couple had a child whose name was Obed. Can you imagine Naomi's joy as she held her little grandson Obed in her arms and poured out her thankful heart to God? The lesson for us is when we go through trials, we may feel discouraged, even brokenhearted. Perhaps we could see no way out of the problems. At such times, we can always trust fully in our Heavenly Father. Of course, he did not bring Naomi's husband and her sons back to life, but he will help us to cope. Perhaps through others showing us the act of loyal love stemming from true friendship. Psalm 1717 defines a true friend. It says a true friend shows love at all times and is a brother who is born for times of distress. Like Naomi, we cannot be sure of how negative situations will turn out. But in Ruth 4 verses 15 to 17, it describes Ruth's love for her mother-in-law as being so strong that others were able to say that she was better to Naomi than seven sons. Thus, Ruth became the mother of Obed, 
an ancestress of King David of Israel and also of Jesus Christ. Therefore, when problems arise, they might not resolve quickly, but we could always look to our Heavenly Father for support, and also we could look to true friends who could help us like Naomi did. Naomi faced so much tragedy and hardship in her life, but she did not let it keep her from allowing her to be happy. <laughs> Now, what did all these three fine women have in common? They all were very spiritually minded individuals. A surgeon that's spiritually minded as they were, are always looking out to follow God's standards. Ephesians, the fifth chapter, verse one, tells us that therefore become imitators of God as beloved children. If God is our heavenly father, then we want to be obedient to him, follow his direction, just like we would our, our earthly father who took care of us through all those formative years. So, and as well as we contemplate God's wonderful qualities, right? It can motivate us now to be able to emanate those same qualities in our life. And it's not always easy, not in the world in which we live in uh, today. There are so many people that are just fleshly minded, which means they only think of themselves. They don't think about God. They don't think about his standards whatsoever. And sometimes they clash head to head. Psalms, the 19th chapter, verse 144 and 160 says, give me understanding. Your word is truth. There's so many publications, books, right? And they're all there to try to help us. And we appreciate it. But the one book is the Bible that we can truly rely upon because it's inspired of God and it's beneficial for everything that we do in life. The Bible provides answers to questions that basically everybody today asks. Where did I come from? Why are we here? Why does God permit suffering? All those questions. Everyone at some one time answer has asked those himself. There's three things we need to do. Be aware of our need of spirituality. And that's obviously, that's what you have, a spiritual goal, a spiritual desire. That's a wonderful thing. Matthew, the fifth chapter, verse three says, happy are those conscious of their spiritual need. We want to then learn more about God. And what are we going to learn about that? In the, in the Bible, the book he's written for us to have today, Acts 17, 27. Seek God and really find him. He is not far off from each one of us. God is not so distant to us. He's really close to us. The Bible says we draw close to God, he'll draw close to us. And the third part is read and reflect on the message of the Bible today. Psalms 1, 2, 3 reads, His delight is in the law of Jehovah, and he meditates on his law day and night. And I love this last part. Everything he does will succeed. When we do things God's way, with God's blessings, whatever we're attempting, trying to do with our life, the Bible assures us that it will, we will succeed. And attitude, our attitude means really so much. In fact, we all take some type of medication for something. What about a medication that doesn't cost anything? You know what that is? Proverbs 17, 22. A joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit just saps one's strength. In other words, our attitude can make a big difference in our life. It can affect whether we attain a goal that we're striving for or we give up, or whether a tragic event brings out the best in us or brings out the worst in us. To illustrate, let's look at just two individuals. There's two fictitious individuals. One's Alex and one's Brian, and they're at work, and their supervisor's analyzing their work afterwards. Notice the first attitude, Alex. I put so much time, so much effort into this project, and I still didn't get it right. I'll never succeed at this job, no matter what I do. It's never good enough. I'm not even gonna bother trying anymore. That's one person. What about the other one? My boss highlighted aspects of my work that he liked, 
but I made a few fundamental mistakes. I've learned some valuable, valuable lessons that'll help me to do better the next time. So what do you think? Six months from now, which one is going to be the more capable employee? Alex or Brian? And if you were an employee, which one of these two men would you more likely hire? Or which one would you like to work next to? Right? It's obviously the one with the more positive attitude. Proverbs, the 15th chapter, verse 15. All the days of the afflicted one are bad, but the one with a cheerful heart has a continual feast. What does that mean? If we see everything in our life negatively, we're going to always feel afflicted. And every day is going to be bad. Every day is going to be gloomy. But if we focus on positive things, we have a cheerful heart. We'll end up being so much happier in life. But in life, like in anything else, the choice is always just up, up to us how we want to react. All of us deal with stress to greater or lesser degrees, right? What can we do to kind of reduce stress? How can the Bible help us to reduce stress on a daily basis? First, Matthew, the sixth chapter, verse 34. Never be anxious about the next day, for the next day will have its own anxieties. In other words, just take one day at a time. Daily anxieties are just a part of life. Do not increase today's anxieties by adding on tomorrow's on top of them. Just live that one day at a time. Get through that day, go on to the, to the next. Stress can cause anxiety. So you might try first recognize what some, that some stress is inevitable in life. We're not going to be able to avoid of it, none of us. Or fretting over things you cannot prevent that can increase your stress. Don't worry about what you cannot prevent. It's raining today. I want it to be sunny, but it's raining. No, it's raining. You do something else, right? Keeping a positive attitude. Second, understand quite often that things don't turn out the way you may fear they do. And that's generally in life, everything. We always think worse than reality is. Remember when you were a kid and you wanted to ride a roller coaster? You were petrified. You were, you were sure something was going to happen. But your friends kind of pushed you around a little bit. You went, okay, 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 I'll go with you. And you went with them. You realized that's not that bad. It was okay. You want to go again? Yeah, sure, I'll go again. After that, now I'm bored. We'll go to something else. Remember what you first thought? You thought how terrible it was going to be. And you realized, no, it wasn't. It really wasn't that bad. And that's, that's the way life is in so many ways. That's why it's good that we set reasonable standards for ourselves. James, the third chapter, verse 17. The wisdom from above is reasonable. Try not to be a perfectionist. We can never do anything perfectly. Avoid setting unrealistic high standards for yourself, but also for others as well. Know your limitations. Know your limitations of others. And when you do this, you're going to reduce stress around you and even encourage greater success in life if we're positive. Also, I love this part. Keep a sense of humor. Oh, my goodness. That's so important. When you laugh, even when something goes, goes wrong, right? You relieve tension. You brighten your mood. And you brighten the mood of those around you as well. Another scriptural pro uh, proverb. Proverbs 17, 27. A discerning man will keep calm. Negative emotions certainly can cloud our thinking. So no matter what situation we find ourselves in, we try to stay, as the Bible says, calm. Identify stresses. Note your response. Feel stressed? Maybe you want to note your thoughts, your feelings, your behavior. Perhaps even keeping a little record or journal of them. Becoming more aware of your personal response, how you react to a situation, you may be able to deal with it a little more effectively by staying calm. Also, try to see things in a different light. Don't be quick to assume bad motives in others. Somebody cuts ahead of you in the line at a store, right? Right away, yeah, yeah, yeah. You get up, you get upset. Well, maybe he's in a, has an emergency situation. He has to run somewhere. Think the more positive. This way, you stay calm, and you don't escalate maybe a situation that, that shouldn't take place really in the first place. You're at a doctor's office. 
We've all had to wait a little while in a waiting room, haven't we? Right? Use it, per, uh, uh, use it productively. You know, we all have the iPhones, basically, or a book. Right? Do some reading, do some research, do some emailing or whatever to use up your time in a productive manner and to keep you calm. Keep the big picture in mind. Will this problem be a big issue today, tomorrow, or next week? How many things made you anxious last week? You don't remember what they are today. We just don't remember those things. A wonderful illustration told me many years ago was that of marble. You take the marble, you put it right in front of your eye. What do you say? Only the marble. It's a big deal. But once you put it at arm's length and put it in perspective, you just see it's a little marble. So a lot of times that's what a lot of our problems in life are. They're just really a little marble. We just kind of need to put them at arm's length. And all things that can help us remain calm. We also want to try to be orderly. 1 Corinthians 10, uh, 14, 40. Let all things take place decently and by arrangement. Try to maintain order in your life. One thing that can contribute to disorder and stress is procrastination. This may lead to a growing list of unfinished tasks. What happens? You, you put so much on yourself, so many things you got to do, that it's impossible to do them all. So what do you do? You mentally shut down. And you don't do any of them. At least that's the way I am when that happens. Right? So what we want to do is make a practical schedule possible, stick to it, or identify and correct any attitudes that cause us to procrastinate. Maybe we just take on too much at a, at a time. And that's something good to keep in mind, to be able to keep things in a nice orderly manner. Also, we need to uh, pursue a balanced lifestyle. Ecclesiastes, book of Ecclesiastes, the fourth chapter, verse six. Better is a handful of rest than two handfuls of hard work and chasing after the wind. Workaholics, right, can deprive themselves of the benefits of their two hands of hard work. They may have no time or energy left to enjoy what they work for. You work so much, you never enjoy what was you're able to do. Have a realistic view of work and money. More money does not mean more happiness and less stress. In fact, Ecclesiastes, the fifth chapter, verse five, says plenty, the plenty belongs to the rich ones, does not permit him to sleep. Otherwise, he's got so many things he has to worry about and take care of that he can't even sleep anymore. Right? So, uh, Make time to relax. Just take some time to relax. Re relieve your stress by doing that. Do things you enjoy. Maybe have a hobby that you enjoy. Those are what some of the ideas that you know we use as well and we found very practical in, in God's word. Also, take care of your health. Physical training is beneficial. First Timothy 4.8. Regular exercise promotes better health for all of us. Develop healthful habits. Physical activity can lift your mood, improve your body's response to stress, as well as eating, eating well and getting enough rest. And of course, as we always say, right? You don't feel well, see your doctor. If your stress becomes overwhelming, getting professional help is never, never an admission of failure. It just, it just shows the wisdom that you're showing. Also, we want to set priorities in our life. Philippians, the first chapter, verse 10. Make sure of the more important things. We always want to make sure we carefully consider our priorities. List your tasks in order of importance. This will help you focus on the more important jobs that we all need to do on a daily basis. And it reveals which ones you can put off, you can delegate to someone else, or just eliminate completely is not important right now. Schedule some downtime, even short breaks throughout the day can invigorate you and reduce stress. Don't feel you got to do everything one day, you know? None of us are able to ever accomplish that. Get support as you're doing. Proverbs 12, 25, anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word cheers it up. Kind, compassionate words from others can always, always, always lift or spirits. How do you, when you feel better when someone yells at you, 
or when someone says, you're doing a great job, you look great, right? Talk things over when you have issues, as you're doing with understanding people. A friend may help you see things differently or even see a solution you overlook. Sometimes we're just so close to the problem, we don't see it. It takes another person, a neutral individual, to be able to help us out in that regard. And we all need that at times. And just sometimes talking, unburdening yourself, can mean all the difference, all the difference. So continue to care also for your spiritual need. This is a scripture we used earlier at Matthew 5, 3. Happy are those conscious of their spiritual need. That's what we're all here, right? We're all today sharing our spiritual, our personal spiritual journey with you and what's helped us over the decades. As humans, we all need mo more than food, clothing, and shelter. We all have a spiritual need. To be happy, we must be conscious of that need and carefully attend to it. Prayer can be a big help. 1 Peter 5, 7. God invites us to, I quote, throw all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And those examples of those three individuals uh, in the Bible, that they really felt that way in their life. And that's how things were able to improve. And it can improve for us as well. Prayer and wholesome meditation can result in deep inner peace. Read spiritually uplifting things. The Bible's at Proverbs 3.24 says, practical wisdom that to, to for us to have practical wisdom and thinking ability. And the scriptures help us to do that. So set a goal. Maybe set a goal to read the Bible. And what's always good is to start with possibly is the book of Proverbs and all the wonderful Proverbs that are written there for our direction. And finally, we can all kill our stress with kindness. Proverbs eleven seventeen: a kind man's benefits himself, but a cruel person brings trouble on himself. We may also get stressed by treating, relieve stress, excuse me, by treating other people kindly. For example, we shouldn't make harsh or unrealistic demands even on ourselves. We should not belie, belittle or malign ourselves. Jesus said at Mark 12, 31, you must love your neighbor as yourself. So just as you would love your neighbor, yes, you have to love yourself as well. And Proverbs 19, 11, the insight of a man certainly shows slows down his anger and it is beauty on his part to overlook an offense. It's been said that stress degrades health. Forgiveness protects health. A forgiving spirit then may minimize stress-related feelings that we may have. Thank you, So Artie. we hopefully have been able to share some of these points from the scriptures for you. Uh, we're not official <laughs> representatives of the Jehovah's Witness organization, but this is what we've learned and what's helped us personally over the years. All and right. Well, thank you, Artie and Nancy and Mary Lee, for sharing those insights from the Bible and from your own experience. Um, now, this Saturday, this group that was created, Saturday Spirituality Group, is um, uh, we attract. Uh, well, I'm I'm uh, as the facilitator. I'm someone with a serious mental health challenge. Some people call it mental illness. Uh, often we attract people uh, to this group who also have similar mental health challenges. So, uh, and I appreciate that you that uh, the ladies brought up stories of other women who were um, experiencing tragedy after tragedy and how it affected their mental health and how they turned to God for solace. And that was a beautiful thing. And then, you know, the miracles happened and their lives improved. Um, but let me ask the three of you, Nancy, Artie, Mary Lee, um, have you... Do, have you personally experienced like a, a, a mental health challenge in your lives or or did you um, ever help or or know of someone who experienced a serious mental health challenge, whether that be, you know, depression or, or bipolar disorder or even someone who experienced psychosis? Uh, 
Let's see if you can you guys can uh, dig on that topic. Who wants to take that first? You want to mute yourself? Um, so uh, I, I'm a physician assistant, so I worked in the internal medicine for 15 years until recently. Um, so in internal medicine, we take care of the patient and including their mental health. And so a uh, person's primary doctor might be um, the first person they go to if they don't feel well. Um, sometimes they don't know what's wrong, really. Um, they might just say they're tired or they're not sleeping well. You know, so it's our job to figure out uh, is this a physical problem or is it their mental health? And I um, uh, ha have had patients, you know, they lost someone uh, they cared for very much, um, maybe a spouse or a parent, and um, you're just dealing with the grief. And uh, I found that it's uh, not just only giving them a prescription, but listening to them and um, just um, uh, showing empathy uh, and support, I think it was very helpful. Um, I had one patient, um, he uh, had bipolar disorder, but he was, since he was doing well, he had um, tapered his medication. Um, unfortunately, uh, oh, uh, some time went by and then he was not doing well. So, um, and he told me, um, a lot of things were going on in his life, and um, um, he, was, he was losing job after job, and he was in a custody dispute uh, to um, have visitation with his daughter. So, um, you know, and it's, he told me that really uh, just made me really sad. Was um, I, you, you have to ask patients if they have some kind of support system. And... He said he had no friends or family he could rely on, and it made me very sad. Um, I think it, I think it's great that a, a group like City Voices is available to uh, help people, um, you know, give them that uh, support network and uh, the friendships they need to, you know, to be able to deal with challenges in life. Um, and you know, um, I, I I did spend a long time. I spent forty five minutes with this patient. Um, you know, uh, just to make sure everything was okay. He agreed to go back and he was very thankful for. And, you know, after, I saw him after that, he was doing better. Yeah, I got I to gotta bring this up to here. Okay. I can relate that I had a family member uh, that is bipolar and was in uh, or under suicide watch for a while. And uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, what uh, Nancy said is, is so true. You have to be supportive. You have to do everything you can in a loving way to uh, get them the medical attention and the help that they need, even when they sometimes don't always want it. But if you continue to be, you persevere, and apply many of those Bible principles of being calm and uh, being loving all the time, uh, you can slowly help that individual. Uh, get them the right medical attention, get them on the right medication if that's, in, that's needed and was, that they eventually now lead a perfectly normal life. And, uh, but it's, it's using all those principles to try to help them. And that that's what I found very, very helpful in, in my in my case. Because it was a close hand thing. Mm -hmm. You wanna? You yeah. wanna? Okay. Well, um No, I sent it. I sent it on the phone. No, it, it 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 is. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, I no, misunderstood. No, 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 okay. okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, um my problem was uh I suffered depression and um I could shrack back where it started. Um, my mother described herself not as an atheist, not as a theist, which is a belief in itself, but she was a deist. A deist starts with a D, D-E-I-S-T. And it's 
it's something you could look up. The deists believe in a creator, but a creator that does not interfere in human affairs. And she taught me, yes, there was a creator, but he abandoned us. So that uh, way of thinking did not make me happy. My father was an agnostic, and he always quoted from Karl Marx. And he said, would say, religion is the opium of the people. And that did not make me happy. And both of them had a poor attitude towards religious people. They felt they were wasting their time of foolishness. So that caused depression for me for many years. Very, very severe depression. Like they have that funny saying, you could have kind of scraped me off the sidewalk. Well, I had a, a memory as a small child. I was on the beach with my mom. It was a sunny day, having a nice time, playing with the sand. The ocean was coming up in, in waves. And, and uh, my mom decided that was a good time to tell me about what death is. And so then I, I said, oh, and I said, so mom, I said, but then we'll pop up again, right? And she said, no. So after that, it was like a gray curtain came down in front of me. And I found my existence to be dismal for many years. And for that reason, I wanted to know what was in the Bible. And when I was 13 years old, I read the New Testament. All Bibles are the same. And, you know, you can find a Bible easy to read. And, you know, we have one. And they're out there. Uh, so I read the New Testament on my own. And it made sense to me. And I loved it. Then I was looking for someone who was willing to talk to me about the Bible. And I finally found someone about three years later. I was uh, around 16. And I started to learn many accounts, even in the Old Testament, like the account of Ruth and Naomi. And um, about how God was a compassionate God and a loving protector to whom we could run to. And that interested <laughs> me. But I still wanted to know how I could trust the Bible because I was brought up along the lines of atheism. So I learned through studying the Bible that the Bible agrees with science, it agrees with history and archeology. span So then I was able to put faith in the one who the Bible calls the happy God, who planned out a happy future for us. And I developed a happy outlook in life. And 1 Timothy 1.11 is where it says he's the happy God. Another uh, point uh, is that we spoke earlier about uh, there can be tragedies in our life and how we can, how we handle it. Uh, I used to live across the street from my, my parents and my grandfather. We bought a house there and my father came over we were working and he had a heart attack so we rushed into the hospital and he was there for 45 days and my grandfather lived across the street two days before my father passed my grandfather passed so i had my father my grandfather died two days later my father dies and i had to bury them both on the same day I thought I was handling everything fine. <laughs> I wasn't. I ended up uh, getting an arrhythmia and being in a cardiac unit for two days, right, from the stress. We can all feel that. And then I had to go on some, you know, obviously some medication after that to make sure I didn't get a, a heart arrhythmias and, and to kind of calm me down a little bit. So there's stresses, but uh, between taking practical advantage, doing what you need to do, and getting help. Don't ever feel ashamed. Get help. I did. And it 
made all the difference in the world. You know, people think everyone has perfect lives. None of us do. We all have to go through anxieties and tragedies. And um, I hope that's in some way helpful to take care of yourself as well. Um, thank you, Artie, Nancy, Mary Lee, for um, for those wonderful um, and vulnerable um, expressions uh, in response to my question. Um, now let's open it up to our beautiful audience. Now, uh, and, uh, most of us have been here since the beginning of this conversation, this presentation. And if anyone has any comments or questions for our panel, um, please go ahead, unmute yourself. Barry, you unmuted yourself? Yeah, I did. Can you hear me? Yeah. OK, I'm cool, good. Remember when they said all three of Jehovah Witnesses, if I'm correct, right? Um, I kind of studied Jehovah Witness since I was like eight years old because there was a book that came out with God, all things are published, a blue book. I read the book and everything. It's like, and I really followed Jehovah. I know when it started, where it come from and everything like that. But I never became a Jehovah Witness because mm -hmm. certain things I didn't believe in. Because I'm not one of religion. That's another thing. I didn't try Islamic and everything, Christianity. And then I ended up with Buddhism in my life because the determination, more or less, not so much as their practice, it was determination. And I really stopped believing, trusting in God years ago. For the simple fact, one thing that God, it's like I did, the preachers wouldn't answer my question. Because I would see so much thing going on in the world, hatred, people are dying and stuff like that. And I grew up in the era of TV at the Vietnam War, Malcolm X, Jeff getting get assassinated. I would say, where is God? And the Jehovah Witness told me years ago, it's called Unforeseen Circumstances. So I pretty much left it like that. But where I found the work in my favor, I started depending on myself. Not to be Eric or nothing like that. I trust my judgment. I did take teachings from the Bible. I took teachings from everybody to make myself a better person. But I trust my judgment, stuff like that. And so far, I've been quite successful with trusting my judgment. I get calls from people every day. Can you help me? Because they trust my judgment. Because I'm very practical and I'm very open. And I'm very honest with people about what they're going through. Yes. I had no problem to me. See, the people say, I believe in God. This one guy said, I've been anointed and I believe in God. I said, that's a good thing. So what do you need my help for? Mm -hmm. And then he looked, he said, because certain things that, if you believe in God, I got no problem with that. But I can only be with so much if you believe in your God. Because I'm a human being. So it's like, you can come to me for things that I can help you. But if you believe in God, it's like, a, let your God help you sometime. I have no problem saying, you believe in your God, but look at your life. Your life is a rat. You're a mess. But you believe in God. Where is your God? You have no food. You got no money. But you believe in God. How come God won't give you money? I have a person that gave close to $7,000. So you know what? I'm not your banker. I said, God told me to come. I said, but I'm not your banker. I said, why did God send you to me? I said, God didn't give you that. I gave you the money. It didn't come from God. It came from me. Not God, me. And Queen says, so you and your God quit using me, coming to me for money. And I nipped it in the bud. $7,000 <laughs> later, but it's over now. <laughs> but the thing, is, if what you believe in is out of the problem, what you believe in, be practical about it, something like that. You really don't. Because one thing is Jehovah's Witness like this, that I want to come Thanksgiving, so that stuff I don't believe in, to be honest with you, it's the work to my lives. They don't believe in it. And pagan holidays, I don't believe in. Don't believe in that neither. But this is the, the way the world is today. It's like, it's kind of fun, though. Thank Valentine's. It's kind of fun. Don't mean it. It's just the fun of it all. Thanksgiving people come together. But you know the history of Thanksgiving? Not a good thing. Independence Day, fortune. Not a thing that's really came on June 19th because black people didn't have their independence in 4th of July. And so the bottom line is that I do good with my life. I do take bits and pieces from any religion and make my world work for me. <laughs> and it works for me. I'm just a scholar of religion. I love to study. 
I didn't read about five spirituality books to be on point. I stopped taking medication because I've trusted myself and my judgment. I'm good with the help of everybody, with Jehovah Witness, Buddhists, everybody helped me get to this point. And that's like I said, that I'm at peace with myself because I took everything, I didn't put everything, I'm a Jehovah Witness, I don't do that. I took every religion in the world to make myself who I am today. And I'm happy with myself. And I'm good. And All thanks right. to the three of you for your panel. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. That was really nice. Uh, so it, it was a little, so Jehovah's Witness helped you, Buddhism helped you, exactly. uh, your friends helped you, your fa maybe a little bit of family, I don't know. Um, yeah, that too, yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you for your comment, Barry. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, does anyone else have a question or a comment for our esteemed panelists? Uh, please unmute yourself. Oh, Ruth, Ruth, go ahead. Let me uh, lower your hand. You go ahead. Uh, I'll ask you to unmute yourself, Ruth. Right. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Oh, yeah. So I've known um, Mary Lee. We've known each other since we were teenagers. I mean, a long, long time ago. We went to school together and all. And, you know, we both had our journeys of what brought us to, you know, the point that that we're at, you know, I'm also one of Jehovah's Witnesses. I was not raised as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, um, but yes, it it was, um, my life was not right until I became one of Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, and, and just, um, you know, and, and uh, um, you know, uh, I guess, um, you know, the different experiences I had as a young person, just trying to fit in and all, you know, and then that, what me to you know uh, when I was offered I always had a belief in the Bible and spirituality but it all came together once I had my questions answered and uh, here I am I'm in my 60s now you know I've raised children that are also you know uh, Jehovah's Witnesses um, I you know not immune to things you know I I mean I you know uh, uh, have I'm on medication myself for anxiety. You know, I have children that have been diagnosed with, you know, uh, uh, severe, you know, behavioral and mental health challenges and uh, an ex-husband, severely bipolar, you know, uh, schizophrenic, you know, and, and we had a child together that wound up, you know, developing that also. Um, but the one thing that helped me get through everything was my spirituality and my reliance on you know god and um my study my congregation my friends you know the whole the whole picture and then um i i was not working for many 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 years and i needed to um find something that i can could could work part time and I wound up working for a children's program. I am a family peer advocate and I work with families that, um, I work with the parents that have children that have behavioral, um, mental health challenges, um, you know, that have been hospitalized. You know, they're trying to keep their families together. I work for Family Service League, the, par the Parents Parent Program. So this is gonna be a very great resource that I'm going to share, um, share yes, with with uh, the families, um, to for the parents because one of the main things that we first things that we talk about is helping the parents to uh, uh, take care of themselves, you know. And a lot of the parents that I work with have, you know, some their own uh, physical and mental health challenges themselves. Uh, and so we have that in common, you know, we've raised children, I've raised children, I have my own um, challenges. And the one thing that I appreciate so much when I work with a family is if I find out that they have a spirituality of their, their own. Um, I can't teach them the Bible or, you know, volunteer information, but if they start a conversation with me and we talk about spiritual things, I find that that's really a big thing that helps, you know, to get through that part of their journey, you know, dealing with the day-to-day -day things, you know, if they have prayer, if they have faith, um, if, if they understand like uh, uh, the fruitages of the spirit is a big one, 
that we used in our household with our kids growing up, you know, you know, to, to be kind, to be patient, to, you know, the, the fruitages of the spirit. Um, I, I didn't have anything prepared, so I'm just going off the cuff here, you know, but, um, and Mary Lee, you know, and authors not know me as long as Mary Lee, but Mary Lee knows that there is no way in the world that I could have gotten through the challenges of my life if I did not have the faith and the it gave me the courage to keep going. Um, I, you know, uh, it, and I, I really appreciate when I could put that as part of the support, you know, like I provide the parents with resources. So I'm going to give them this link, you know, I'm going to pro provide them with this resource. So, um, it, you know, um, if you don't mind me doing that, you know, sharing your website with them, it's going to be, you know, um, so, uh, but that, you know, um, you know, th there's just like, I've been one of Jehovah's Witnesses since I was 18 years old. And like I said, I had a, a, that connection with my spirituality before that but it just put everything in place so all my questions were answered it is just you know um so much value in the truths of the bible and what the theme of the bible is you know and how it could help in our lives even when we're suffering like i said three children with a diagnosis myself and now i've been working with you know so many families on long island since 2006 that have challenges themselves. But again, um, to emphasize just as the Bible is timeless, right? So the value of the, the guidance and the direction that those in history, you know, receive that comfort and that strength and that courage, right? And to be able to go on is still current to this day. It's not outdated, right? I mean, yeah, it's a, the Bible is a book of history, correct? But it's so much more than that, right? It, it helps us to get through each and every moment of our day. So, um, okay, that's All it. All right, Ruth. <laughs> wow. Well, thank you for opening up your heart and um, sharing with us. And um, yes, the Bible is, uh, for many people, it's the best self-help book. And also, um, it helps us to have a relationship with a higher power, which can sustain us during challenging times. I mean, Alcoholics Anonymous has known about this for, for decades. Uh, it's part of the 12 steps to establish that relationship. All right. Uh, Helen Newman, um, I think you were uh, very expressive with your emojis. Do you have anything you'd like to share with us, Helen Newman? If you can unmute yourself, Helen. But it's okay. If you don't have anything to say, we'll move on. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, no, no. What, Sandy, is that you? You you unmuted yourself? Oh, she's back to mute. All right. Well, anyone else who uh, you could raise your hand or you could simply unmute and speak if the spirit moves you. <laughs> And sometimes we lapse into silence, and that I think that's okay too, because silence is golden. Just talking. Well, I just wanted to say one thing about what Ruth's experience. What she didn't say was that she grew up with her mother in a wheelchair. Her mother got married in a wheelchair, raised her in a wheelchair, so she had that. Uh, that experience as well that what wasn't an happifying experience to be raised like that but yeah. you know so how you know the bible just helped her you know have strength gave her renewed strength and one thing to say quickly my philosophy comes from malcolm x is like by any means necessary and I would go to any length to make myself better. And I really would. If I got to sit on a corner and be a high with Krishna for a week, if it make me better, I would do that. And so far, I didn't have to do that. Thank you. But everything did work for me. Because I used to hang up for years. I hung up with the whole with a block away from it. I was going to hang up. We sit and talk, laugh, and go eat and everything, go to a party. It was great. 
but they never forced me to become a Joe because they knew the type of person I was. And it worked for me. And everything worked in my favor. I'm happy with my life because one thing is like coping skill. And that's what I teach people how to cope. You can have all the Bible in your life, all the joy. If you don't have coping skills, you depend on the Bible thing, but you got to depend on yourself to a certain degree. Trust your judgment. And that's what I teach. Trust your judgment. Because you come this far, you can't trust your judgment. And with the help of your higher power, you call it Jehovah, some people call it Yahweh. But it goes back to one person, the, the master of the universe. That's what I looked at. Because the Buddhists told me I shouldn't go to church. I like going to the church and going to the hall. I get a dollar of it. Wherever there's information, I'll be there. That's why I go to funnel information. All right, Barry. Very nice. Um, let's see. Let's see. Oh, um, is it ta am I am I pronouncing T A O as Tao or is it Dao? Tao Yang. Yes, Tao Yang. Is it Tao or Dao? Oh, we can't quite hear you. Right. Oh, that's too bad. All right, let's see who else we got here. Jenny Schneider. Jenny Schneider. How are you feeling? How are you doing? And uh, what's been your experience listening today? Um, I tend to agree with Barry. Um, I just feel like you have to rely on yourself and have coping skills. And I don't believe in God, so that doesn't even apply to me. <laughs> um, okay. I find spirituality and creativity, um, cre like cre painting or writing or music um i don't know i think a lot of what was said is good information but i wouldn't um use the bible as a reference point so thank you jenny for sharing that and it's uh by the way it's tau not dow um tau says so um uh, jenny uh, do you consider yourself a spiritual person i mean I consider myself a creative person. I don't know. I think that's sort of the same thing for me. Mm -hmm. And how do you express your creativity? Um, through poetry and painting and music. Do you have a poem for us, Jenny? I do, but I'm not going to read it. What? <laughs> Why not, Jenny? Because I don't, I don't want to be put on the spot like that. <laughs> but Jenny, we can't see you. <laughs> Okay, Jenny, it's no problem. No pressure. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's see now. Who else is here? Um, oh, Chaplain James is here, but you just arrived. You're a latecomer, Mr. Chaplain. Um, we have Laura, Ca Laura Campos. Hello, Laura. Do you have any, uh, <laughs> any uh, feelings about what was said today? Hi, actually, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. yes. Okay, I'm 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 on my Zoom phone. I was having technical difficulties. I'm a personal friend of Nancy Coe's, and I'm also one of Jehovah's Witnesses. So, just here to support and give her some technical tips when the echo uh, uh, happens on Zoom calls and such. But uh, I appreciate everyone's expressions of vulnerability and honesty. Um, just to share, I actually grew up, my father being an atheist and my mother being one of Jehovah's Witnesses. So um, uh, I, I, I kind of grew up with my parents being, you have to do this because this is what good human beings do and you have to do this because this is what your creator um, believes is the best for you. So I can appreciate some of the perspectives shared on the call. Um, just to share, something vulnerable both my parents died of rare cancers within six years of each other um when my father was was actually very already very ill what was very interesting he, him being an atheist what would calm him down was to listen my mother read the psalms because she would read the poetic ones so it was very calming to him uh, at the end to um hear those uh those expressions 
and a lot of the ones that were uh, written by David, uh, if you have a chance, they are one of the most poetic ones because David was a poet in the Bible. And so he has very wonderful uh, imagery and comforting metaphors um, that even somebody who may not believe there is a God or is agnostic would find um, uh, pleasing, at least in its construction, and also the emotional uh, evocative images that it brings of comfort, of not being alone in the universe, and that someone is there to care for them, that even at their darkest hour, um, you know, when David says that, you know, uh, he was surrounded by his enemies, he felt that there was a helping hand. And sometimes mental health issues can be like that. You, you feel like you got stuck in a very dark and lonely place that no one can truly understand. And the scriptures provide that um, imagery of someone you know, reaching down to you in that dark well with their right hand and pulling you out. For us, it's the creator, Jehovah, and also his instruments, which are human beings, loving human beings that we are surrounded with in our congregation. And that also because we, we make that effort to put forth and apply the counsel, we also become instruments of that loving kindness. And we attract people through our loving kindness. So we are giving back that love into the universe, so to speak. So I hope that provides people with um, a thought, some food for thought and comfort that applying those principles turns us into loving beings and we become mirrors of that imagery of a loving creator. And for us, it's not just for the now, it's for the future. That love will be eternal. It's ever growing and ever evolving to the conditions in which the world and humanity finds themselves. So that love is transformed and it is there because <clears throat> the word that uh, we use for Jehovah in Hebrew, it means he causes to become and it's in the imperfect sense. So he is ever evolving. The creator is ever changing to adapt to the needs of his creator. So he's a, the perfect parent in that regard, right? Being perfect people, <clears throat> we may have our limits because of imperfection, but the creator, he is ever evolving and he changes according to the context of the creation. And right now, the context of the creation is to heal people, to let them have hope that there is something better out there, that eventually, all the conditions that cause psychic suffering, because they don't happen in a vacuum. We know that a lot of psychic suffering is because of the conditions in the world. He's going to put a solution to that because, again, he is the ever adaptive creator and he's going to respond to the uh, at the right time to the suffering, both psychic and literal, that afflicts humanity. So I hope that that brings comfort to uh, to our audience here. So let me ask you, Laura, when you were experiencing tragedies in life, um, how did 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 how did um, the higher power, God, Jehovah, whatever you want to say, um, uh, did 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 the power bring good people into your life who, who formed comfort or did you have like a silent communion with a higher power? I think it's both. Um, what happened to me, I think one of the, the thoughts that always comforted me was what the prophet Isaiah, who was going through, um, you know, one of the, the darkest periods in, uh, <clears throat> in the biblical account, it said in, um, and I'm translating because I, I, I worship in, in Spanish, but one of the things that always comforted me was he says, God says to, uh, to his nation, he's not only talking uh, to the prophet that as a mother comforts their son, 
I am the one that will comfort you this way, he says uh, to, um, to degree. And that here I am extending peace like a river. Um, it's Isaiah 66, 13. As a mother comforts her son, so I will keep comforting you. And over Jerusalem, you will be comforted. And the context of this is Jerusalem was in the midst of destruction by Babylon. You know, great, great tragedy. And for me, this really reaffirmed that the creator who created my mother would comfort me in her absence. You know, and that you're really never alone in that sense. Do I miss the human beings? Of course I do, um, but I am not alone. And then the human factor is when Jesus says to his followers that if you are abandoned, he said uh, in Matthew, that uh, you would receive a hundred times homes, family, friends. So again, it's not, um, it is not a permanent loss, if I could say it that way, that both God and those he chooses as his instruments who also want to be in that role because he doesn't force people. People need to want to reflect his, um, his love. And I have received that. I live that. I have family all over the world. I have 8 million people within my congregation, you know, and they don't even have to speak the same language to show me love. They will open their doors for me. That is incredibly comforting. That is, especially when you see the tragedy in the world, that all we need to do is really love each other. And we would have so much, uh, so much more peace and beauty, even amidst what's happening. That is, you know, indescribable. It's like there's uh, human language is a little too imperfect to describe that for me, that I have a home with strange, what, what people would constitute strangers because of the, you know, the faith that I have, the community that I have. The community that worships that God creates in themselves being instruments of that love, that universal love. So that's that's how that's what I've experienced personally. And I, that's my wish for everyone to experience that level of love and community wherever they go, wherever they find themselves in life. And I'm sure that oh, who who's speaking? I want to say something right quick what she said, like community of love. Go ahead, go ahead. When he, I raised two daughters by myself. I just come off of drugs from Schenectady, and I have my daughter. I said, what the heck I'm going to do with two girls? I have five hours off of drugs and everything. Never look back. March the 21st would be 20 years. And I would go to God and say, God, I need help. I do not know what I'm doing. I got no help, I felt. Nobody helped me. I went to AA for help with my dog. Nobody helped me. And that's why I started depending on myself with everything. Because I looked to God. There was no help. And my daughter told me something last year. You know how come God didn't see nobody buried, Daddy? Because you didn't need nobody. That's what I mean. I have been yelled at because I don't believe in God. I just got here like a couple of weeks ago. It's like, it's not a question of believing what I believe in. I do what works for me. And that's on and that people in the AA said, tell me, I am my daughter's higher poverty. They said, you're arrogant. And so I said, until they get the God of their own, I'll be that guy. I ain't got no problem with that. When they got the God of their own, they said, I was no longer that guy no more. It's that guy, nothing to get somebody. But I know what it's like to be all alone. I reached that there was nobody there. That's the kind I depend on myself and not God, me. And to this day, it's me. But I'm, I have a good life, though. And then because God gave it to me, it's confusing with bottom line. I have a great life. Whoever gave me this life, 
I don't care who gets it's good. And my daughter's yeah. had great and successful. <laughs> Mary, does like um like feeling love again um play a role in that? Feeling love? I give my love to people by helping people. I've been doing it for 40 years. That's where my level of love and comfort come from. That's what about what about love to yourself? I love myself to death. I be <laughs> careful. I really do. I find my, I find I'm a really decent, good person and stuff like that. I'm really good the way I, I help people and stuff like that. And that's my lot in life. I always say I didn't want nothing out of life. I just wanted to help people. And I realized man, maybe I do want something. I do have a good life and stuff like that. And I help people all the time. I get called every day. I'm having a problem. How you help me? And I help her. I talked to this woman for an hour and a half. Like, you know what she said? Are you there? I already had, she didn't want to talk. So I said, if I already have, I said, I got to go at nine to call. Because that's the love I send to people, just being there for them. And I always say, who's going to be there for me? Not financially, neither. I don't need your money. But financially, it's like, besides a therapist, besides a psychologist, some decent human being to say, I'm there for you. Mm -hmm. I did get sick at Fountain House was there for me. No, and they, they weren't there for me when I did get sick like a couple I'm weeks ago. I'm there for you. Can I get Thank in you. there? Yeah, Chaplain You're James, welcome. come on, chime in. What's I'm up? Gonna, How you like, doing? You can't, you can't keep a good man down. And right. see, that's what happened because you canceled for two weeks. Uh, you broke my schedule. Laura, how are you? Laura, where are you? Laura Campos. Hello. <laughs> How are you, Laura? Laura, you are half right, but you have found the way. That's good. Um, it's you. The cause and effect is not exact, and your science is a bit off. But I put my uh, name and contact information in the thing. If you want to speak with me, I can get you right. <laughs> All right. Laura That's seems good. right. She's good. <laughs> yeah. I, I like to see, I like to keep, keep it quick, fast, in a hurry, and uh, be right, exact, and thorough. Well, Chaplain, Laura has 8 million people. You could be 8 million That's and one. All right. That's, That's right. all right. That's all right. That's all right. Put me in that, in that, in that number. <laughs> all right all right now let's hear from heather heather happens to be a family member of one of the panelists heather you there have you been uh, paying attention uh we just see your name but uh oh there you go heather go ahead i'm here <laughs> sorry i just had my thing for um yeah i just wanted to say that um i find uh mental illness uh taking care of yourself just as much important as your physical health i know some people um for years, I just was pushing it under the carpet. People say, oh, I'm fine. I can take care of myself. Nothing's wrong. I could deal with my own stress. But I feel that getting help is very important. And not being afraid to ask for help, uh, therapists, medication. Um, for years, I didn't. And once I reached out, uh, it changed my life. And I think it's important not to be afraid to ask for that help. And it really can change a lot of things in your life. I'm I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that, Heather. Um, and those are that's 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 definitely some wisdom there from personal experience. Uh, Sandy Ellen Brow, are you there? You got anything to say, Sandy? I'll ask you to unmute. You've been here for a while, Sandy. Uh, my Yahoo account doesn't work, so from now on, email me at agnesty nine at gmail dot com. All right. Thank you for that, Sandy. Do you have any comments on today's presentation? No, because I came late. Oh, well, all right. All right. Okay, no please. problem. Let's see. Who else we got here? Uh, I think that covers everybody. All right. We have five minutes left. So let's go back to our panelists, uh, Artie, Nancy, and Mary Lee. Uh, can we get a couple minutes from each of you? Some closing remarks? 
for any other information about Jehovah's Witnesses, the Bible, any topic, you just go to jw.org. You don't have to put in any private information, but everything will just come up there. There's videos, uh, whiteboards, uh, books, booklets, anything that you're interested in, on, even on a specific topic that just interests you. So it's just jw.org. That's all. Just, yeah, I just, you know, want to add that, um, you know, I talked about the compassionate God, and it was also brought out by others that he has compassionate worshipers. So if you're ever having a bad day, and it's a, a, a Sunday meeting day, and hop into a kingdom hall, there's also a midweek meeting, and you'll be surrounded by people who are very interested in you in a loving way. Very. That sounds really nice, you guys. How about uh, Nancy? Oh. Uh, I just want to say that um, I enjoyed hearing everybody, everybody themselves, themselves uh, um, about, uh, about uh, uh, their, uh, their, their uh, progress and journeys uh, spiritually. Um, and uh, just to uh, keep learning, because um, Peter, that's uh, how he made us. Um, to continue to learn and to grow. So uh, definitely um, uh, the wisdom from the Bible has helped us, you know, and we can not only learn it, we put it to use. We can um, uh, really see how it can uh, bring us happiness and um, help us grow spiritually. Oh, right. oh, go ahead, Artie, you got something else? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's really for Barry. I got one for Barry. What's it, Amy, a beautiful little kitty cat? What is it? Uh, I, I, we go by the name of Moose. He got a real <laughs> name, but I don't forget his name. Cause my daughter let me let this cat to me. I've been with this cat for fourteen years. <laughs> now I'm getting ready to move. I got to take him with me too. Ain't that something? <laughs> yeah, I've done that myself more than once. <laughs> <laughs> but I must admit, the cat is very comforting. If I have a situation, the cat will sit with me. I remember yep. one time having a problem with my voice. I was yelling and screaming. The cat sitting right in front of me. I finished yelling. He, he crawled over there and said, we're in late there. And now I tell the cat, I said, I'm all right. Go away. Leave me alone. 